As a child, I went to the cinema, and it was really before movies were shown on television, and in fact, it was before television, because I was born in 1943. So for images, for moving images, the cinema was everything. And um, uh, children in Toronto would go every Saturday to the cinema. And um, I think I definitely remember Bambi, which was traumatizing, <laughs> you know, <laughs> all these Disney movies, uh, Dumbo, um, also traumatizing, because in each case it was some baby being separated from its mother. <laughs> and of course, for a child, that's very traumatizing. Um, and uh, I also remember a movie that disturbed me greatly was called uh, was Blue Lagoon, which was about also about children being separated from their parents and ending up on a deserted island with a drunken sailor. And it was a uh, I, I had to sleep with the lights on after that movie. Um, so, uh, but also not uh, these are the traumatic ones, <laughs> but they're also many movies that were very were wonderful of course and and a lot of disney and a lot of cartoons as well in those days you know you'd you'd go see two movies with cartoons with a news uh, documentary as well so uh and uh, every week basically no so that that's the first um i have to say it was when i started to see european films that I began to think of, well, I've told this story many times, you'll forgive me if I tell it again, because there I was, and the, and the cinema still exists in Toronto. At the time, it was called the Pylon, uh, and, uh, and it has a different name now, but I think it's called the Royal. But um, in those days, I lived in a neighborhood that was full of immigrants, and many of them were Italian, it's, and it's now part of what we call Little Italy in, in Toronto. And um, I was watching my usual, which at that point would be a Hopalong Cassidy movie, you know, and the Durango Kid. These were Western movies that you would see different ones every weekend. And I came out of the cinema with all the other children, and across the street was a cinema called The Studio, which only showed Italian films, because there was enough Italian population to make that viable commercially. And I saw... Uh, grown people coming out of the theater weeping, crying. And I was shocked because I thought, these are grown up people, these are not children. And they're weeping. Some movie has made them, has destroyed them emotionally. Now I remember crossing the street to see what this movie was. And it was La Strada of F Federico Fellini. And that was my first inkling that a movie could have great power over anybody, not just children, but over grown-up people. Uh, and, and later it was European films, um, the, the ones we know, like Fellini and Antonioni and Bergman and Kurosawa and so on, who uh, those films be became my understanding of films as art, not just sort of something for kids. And they were also made like your kind of film school? They were my film school because there was no film school at the time in Toronto. And I'm completely self-taught. I never went to film school. When I started to get interested in film, and for me it was relatively late compared with what would happen if you grew up in Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, of course, everybody had some family member who was in the film business. But in Canada, there was no film industry. There was television, there was a CBC, there was drama there. There was a national film board that made documentaries. But there was really no feature film movie industry. And so it didn't feel accessible. You know, you never thought, oh, you can make a movie here in Canada. No, movies came from some other place, you know. And, uh, and the, the only film school at the time in Toronto was really Ryerson, uh, which was really to teach cameramen, technical people, how to work in television. So it wasn't really a, a cinema school in the, in the way we think of it now. Um, so I was completely self-taught, and, and seeing movies was really was the way I learned. I mean, I think that's the way everybody really learns how to make movies, is to see movies. Well, um, 
Toronto is, uh, you know, it, it, of course it's my home. But my, my roots are here. My parents were, were, were here, and my family history was here. But, um, but Toronto was really a very perfect place, really, for, for movie making, really, uh, because it's halfway between Europe and Hollywood, you know? And I think my filmmaking reflects that. It's, it's a sort of, there's a commercial element, and then there's also a sort of European art movie element. And I think that that comes from where I am, because many of my friends moved to Los Angeles. I mean, Ivan Reitman did, and um, Lorne Michaels went to L.A. and then to New York to, to do uh, Saturday Night Live. And I think they're very influenced by, they've become Americans, basically. And uh, I think their movie making reflects that as well. Um, and I was reluctant to, to do that because I, I, I understood that the pressure, for example, of Hollywood is, is quite extreme. It's like a very dense planet. It has a great gravitational pull. And I think living in Hollywood, it would be very hard to not make Hollywood films, especially for someone who was not an American. And that was why I resisted it. Not that I hated Hollywood filmmaking at all. Of course, I loved it the way everybody loves it. But um, I felt there was there were other things that I wanted to do, not just that. And so that's in a sort of conceptual way uh, why Toronto was important for me. And, and uh, there was a moment when I almost felt I had to go to, to Hollywood. Um, because, for example, we have filmmakers like Ted Kotcheff who went to London to make his films, and we had Norman Jewison who went to Hollywood to make his films. and, and I thought maybe I'm going to have to do that. Um, and I went to LA with a friend, and we rented a, you know, a Mustang convertible. <laughs> we drove through, and, and um, I met all kinds of people like Roger Corman and so on, and they said, because uh, I had an idea for a film which later became Shivers, and I couldn't get it made in Canada. And they all said, well, we love this idea. This is a great idea. We would make this film, no problem. So I thought, I'm going to have to move to LA and become a an, uh, Hollywood filmmaker. By the time I got back to Toronto, Cinepix, which was a Montreal company that was the only place in Canada that had at least started to make movies, and they were in French, in Quebecois, they were French-Canadian movies. Um, they said, we finally got what, what, what is now Telefilm, but then was called the Canadian Film Development uh, uh, Corporation to invest in Shivers, and so we can make the movie. And that was the turning point, because I think another month I would have been gone. But so it was really the European model rather than the American model. That is to say that governments have to support the local, uh, the national film industry, which is not what happens in America. Mentioning Shivers, in your early films you deal with um, diseases, new mutations of the body, uh, issues that scare people, yeah. people are afraid yeah. of that. Did you have to face your own anxieties about that, mm -hmm. overcome them, or how did you go about that? Yeah, um, it, it's funny because I, when I started to write Shivers, my first screenplay, uh, I had no idea what I would write. Uh, I had been a, an enthusiast of science fiction, and uh, but not just science fiction, other other wonderful writing as well, and I and at the time I really did think I would be a novelist, not a filmmaker. I, I didn't. My father was a writer, a journalist, not a, not a novelist. But uh, I, I was I grew up with the sound of the typewriter, you know, in the next room, and I used to fall asleep to the sound of my father's typewriter, you know. So writing came very naturally to me. Um, and, uh, and when I decided to try my first screenplay, I had made a couple of underground films. It was really the New York underground film movement. It was the 60s, you know, do your own thing, grab a camera, you don't have to go to film school, you don't have to be part of Hollywood, uh, you don't have to join a union, you can just make your own film. And that was very liberating. And I had made a couple of films, and I had taught myself to do that by looking up in the encyclopedia we didn't have Wikipedia then. Uh, camera, lens, sound. How do you get the sound to synchronize with the picture? You know, all of those things that people don't have to worry about now with video, or you can do that with your cell phone. 
but in film it's a rather awkward, difficult process. And so I just had figured that out myself and I had made uh, four basically underground films that had been shown in film festivals at the Edinburgh Film Festival and so on. So I actually had a kind of international filmmaking experience before I did my first professional film. Shivers, I think of as my first professional, even commercial film. In other words, I was paid to do it. And I had other people looking over my shoulder, producers. Uh, I had to work with, when I first sat down with my first film crew, um, I had no idea what anybody did. I didn't know what an assistant director was. I didn't know what a production manager was. I had no idea because I had done all of that myself, shot the, the movie, edited it, synchronized the sound, done everything. So I had that experience before I started to write that screenplay. And um, I had no idea what it would be. I had done um, uh, something called Stereo and something called Crimes of the Future. And they were slightly science fiction, but sort of also kind of dreamlike fantasy and so on. Um, I wouldn't say fear was involved, in other words. I wouldn't say it was anxiety. It's more, uh, I, I thought I would be a scientist as well, and I particularly an entomologist. I was very interested in insects and uh, insect life and the, the, the strange forms of life that we have on this planet. I thought we don't have to go to some other planet to find uh, alien life forms, we have them right here. They're fa incredible, and people just don't notice them, but they're fantastic. Um, so I had that medical science interest. Uh, my science teachers all thought I would end up being a scientist, and at a certain point I went to the University of Toronto for a year uh, studying organic uh, chemistry, basically. And, and I thought maybe I would also be maybe a cell biologist, which, was, which now is the hot field, you know, cell biology is, is fantastic because, of course, it involves uh, ge genetic structures and so on, and it's, it's an expanding field. But So I had that background and that interest, and so it was very natural for me, in a way, to write a, a, a film that was like a science experiment. Though it wasn't really so much about fear, even though it is a horror film, there's no question, and it's a scary film, but uh, for me it was... An experiment, you know, and I, I, I was. It, 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 it didn't scare me. The, 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 the process of making movies was scary, though. <laughs> that was terrifying, because it was a lot of very intense. I mean, my first film was a two weeks shooting, a 14-day schedule. You know, that was very difficult, with a lot of special effects and guns and explosions and car crashes and everything else. The idea that you could have a movie on a shelf in your house that you could play any time was revolutionary. Nobody thinks twice about it now, but it was phen phenomenal because I, when I grew up, movies were not on television. In fact, most people didn't have televisions. When there were televisions, um, television was very afraid of Hollywood, and Hollywood was very afraid of television. So they, they didn't go together. So you would watch television, and there were interesting television shows, and there was drama on television, but you couldn't see movies on television. And in fact, in those days, in Hollywood, you were not allowed to show a television set in a movie. The, the studios would say, okay, you can have a family, but I don't want to see in the corner a television set, because they thought of television as the end of cinema, that television would destroy cinema. And it was only when they began to realize that they could sell movies to television and finance movies by doing that, they realized that in fact the two went together very well, cinema and television. And in fact, at a certain point, people thought that cinema, uh, the television had saved Hollywood. Meanwhile, Hollywood de was developing widescreen, cinemascope, stereo sound, color, all of that to defeat television things that you couldn't get in television. The television, you had a very bad image, small screen, black and white. And so Hollywood felt that, so it, in fact, uh, television helped accelerate technical development in film. Uh, of course, I was watching all of this. I was feeling all of this and sensing all of this, even though I didn't necessarily know the politics that were going on behind the scenes. And 
the development of video that you could control yourself was phenomenal. And I bought the first bunch of them. I had a Sony video quarter. There was even a, a tiny little video quarter that used normal uh, audio cassettes to record video. And I had one of those. It was terrible quality, but amazing still. And this was in the 60s. Uh, and uh, I was experimenting even then. And then and ultimately with video cassettes and so on, that really made a huge difference because people had trouble with reel-to-reel -reel cassettes and you had to wind them up and the tape would rip and so on. Anyway, I lived through all of that and it was all very exciting and it's, it, it, uh, but it really meant that you had control, that you had access to film in a way that you never had before, that you could have a library of films was an astonishing idea. Videodrome, no, Videodrome really came from the limitations of television at the time, which was, um, I remember as a child, we had a, an antenna that would rotate to pick up better, uh, you know, each station needed the antenna to rotate to get the best image. So you would be watching your TV set, r rotating the image and seeing it come into focus in a way. And sometimes when the major, this is something else people don't, you now think of it wasn't 24 hour a day television it was you know at 11 o'clock or 11 30 television was finished until the morning you didn't go all night and um, after all the television stations had s shut down you you could sometimes pick up some strange signals from now in Toronto it would be f mostly from America maybe Buffalo uh, maybe from New York maybe from Detroit and those signals were very weak, but you could pick them up late at night. And you would see things, but it would never be clear. Uh, and you wouldn't know what you were watching. And it was very mysterious, and sometimes very disturbing and very intriguing. And so I used that experience with Videodrome. In other words, old technology, really, at the time. I even have scenes of a satellite dish, you know, and so on. Um, but, of course, when I was doing it, it was an antenna, not a satellite dish. There were no satellites. Um, and uh, it was just that idea of picking up a mysterious, forbidden signal that somehow you had access to by accident. And that's really what, what, what had to do with uh, Videodrome. And this idea of a hidden channel strikes me as something very... Um very valid and powerful even today when you yes. think of the internet yes. there is this dark net so there always seems to be a place yes. where people are hoping to find yes. something forbidden or yes that's a, a actually true and and it's why people sometimes think that video drum was anticipating the internet uh, of course, I wasn't really thinking about it, but it's true that some of the things that I was playing with, which is to say interactive television, television that would respond directly to you, uh, was, is in a sense an anticipation of something that has become the internet, really. Uh, so it, it hasn't changed. And yes, there are some very forbidden uh, imagery and uh, videos on, on the internet, which I mean, it, it, it's, it's quite extraordinary that, that the police could come to your house and discover that you had downloaded some images and arrest you and put you in jail for a long time, mostly, you know, child pornography and so on. But it, it, that's an extraordinary thought, that, that the images condemn you immediately uh, and that even though you just sat in your room and clicked to access them, but you were condemned by doing that. That's extraordinary. Video drum has also some groundbreaking, I guess, uh, special effects, which mm -hmm. are based on yeah, certain ideas uh, and met, uh, can be read as metaphors. How did you come up with these crazy ideas? Mm -hmm. Well, it's very... I think in art it's always very mysterious as to where images or concepts come from. Um, it's a, it's, sometimes it's very much a, an imagistic thing, sometimes it's a conceptual thing first and then becomes uh, incarnated in some imagery. Um, 
the idea of a hand turning into a gun, for example, is really begins conceptually, the idea that we are fusing with our own technology, or the idea that technology is not inhuman, which some think people think that technology is this inhuman thing that imposes on us, but in fact it's not. It's, it comes from us, it's part of us, it's an expression of us. And so that first concept and then after that you say, okay, well, how, I, how do I show that dramatically? And that's where you, I came up with the idea of, let's say, uh, a video cassette that can go into your stomach um, or, or a gun that will be, be your hand, will turn into a gun, you know, just to show the fusion of, or the relationship between technology and, and the human body. Technology really begins as the extension of the human body. The telephone is the ear and the voice. Uh, uh, a, a gun is an extension of the fist and so on. So uh, it, it's, you never know whether it's a con which comes first, the concept or the image, you know? And of course, you can dream it, you can, you can find it, you know, by accident. Uh, uh, and often it just comes while you're while you're writing, you know, while you're working. It it just appears. I mean, even in video drum, you see a little Atari controllers and so on. I mean, um, I think it was obvious the the idea of a tiny world that you enter and that you can play in and can. Uh, have experiences in uh, a virtual world. Um, it's really just an extension of the idea of cinema, but cinema that you can control and interact with, or television that you can control and interact with. Once you think in those terms, then a video game is becomes an obvious thing. Um, and uh, even though I was thinking of it at a time when in fact there was just maybe Pong, you know, there wasn't very much in the way of video games, but I was very intrigued by, by that. And I, I was very interested in technology uh, for, for just as a matter of course. Um, I was really, I could see that the typewriter was a ridiculous thing. And I could see that the editing that we did in film was ridiculous. The moviola, stupid. You know, when I was shown these machines, now we have great nostalgia for them. And we have nostalgia for film because it connects to a history and an art and so on. But if you're working with those, you are not nostalgic. You can't wait for something better to happen. And I couldn't wait for word processing. Um, because, uh, so I remember the first PET, you know, the PET. I thought maybe this will, no, it wasn't right. Um, because a typewriter doesn't work the way your mind works. It's a machine. It's from the Victorian era. It's, it's clunky. Uh, t when you want to go to the beginning and then to the end and then to the middle, you can't. You, it's, you have to tape it. You have to, it's, it's terrible. As soon as I saw what a computer could do, that it works like a mind, you know, that it, in other words, not linear, but mosaically, everywhere, back and forth, up and down, left and right, you could change it, move it around. That's what I was waiting for. And I was waiting for that for editing as well. And so I couldn't wait for digital editing. I, 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 I thought it's obvious it's gonna come. And when you imagined uh, this world in existence, uh, why did you choose to to include no screens uh, and to to give it such an earth-like feel yes. in terms of color and, and flat yeah. images? Well, because a screen is an artificial thing. Um, obviously, the ideal for a video game would be that it feels like reality, three-dimensional. So you remember that holographs and holograms were very you know, that was going to be a very popular big thing and that it, you don't read about that much anymore because I think the technology is very difficult. But that would be the ideal, would be that, that you had a game that you physically entered and that responded to you as a physical entity and felt totally real in a three-dimensional way. And so, um, and that's why I have the bioports that plug into you instead of plugging into a computer and a screen. A screen is, is, is just a stopgap, you know, it's just a, it's, it's only because we can't do it any other way. But it's not the ideal. We know what the ideal is, and that's why people are playing around with, 
you know, glasses that will immerse you and, and all kinds of things. Um, but we know what the ultimate is, you know, the, and, and everybody's trying that with, with sort of motion control and all of that. Really, it's to, it's to recreate reality, but in our own image. That's what we, I mean, all art is that, in a way. All art is that. You try to do it through words with a novel. You try to do it with imagery and sound and technology, if it's a film. But it's, all of those are, they're not what we really want. What we really want is quite dangerous, but then that's the, w the human way. Yeah, I mean, to me, existence um, felt like, sure, sci-fi, uh, like a scary movie, but also um, it has f funny moments. But these moments, yeah. I think, uh, don't uh, s um, offer comic relief, yes. but on the other hand, they, they are really scary. Yes. Uh, for instance, these uh, game loops yes. that Ted discovers. Uh, how did you come up with that? Which, which part of it? The, the game loops, this, uh, this moments when, um, yeah, not, uh, so to say, um, reality is in question, but your own subjectivity. Oh, yes. I think this was the real horror of it. Yes, yes, yes. Well, that's, that's why I say that what we want uh, out of art, out of games, out of our creativity is dangerous because it is, it's, a, it's a different, it would be a very potent alternate reality that would have the weight of full reality and the consequences of full reality and would be uh, very difficult to control, if not impossible to control in any way. And also would be incredibly confusing because our minds, as the animals that we are, have not really kept up with our technology. I mean, you see this, you see this all the time. Every time you read the newspaper, we, we, see, we seem very animalistic and capable of the most incredible brutality and stupidity. And, and yet the most sophisticated kinds of technology and, and concepts and philosophy as well. And that would extend into this strange world of, of, of um, new realities that we would be creating. And they would also be on our own image, just as our technology has always been, which is to say it would be the best of us and the worst of us. You know? So that, that's... Uh, And, and at the same time, I, have, I, I think I have not made any movies that aren't funny as well, you know, but it's, this, is, this is the human way of dealing with the absurdity of human existence, is you, you have to have a sense of humor, um, even if it's a scary one. One of the things that you inevitably deal with if you're if you're working with actors, uh, is identity. You know, when you say something you don't want to do, what is the, who's the you? Where is that you? What, in what does that you consist, you know? I mean, of course, I deal with it in Spider in a more contemporary way, and because that's schizophrenia, which, which is uh, in many ways an identity disease, a disease of identity, and it, it's very revealing. Um, but of course, um, anybody who is you know, working in the arts eventually must deal with the question of identity, even if it's only of the identity of the artist, you know. What is the you that wants anything? And, uh, and what is the you that controls the I, <laughs> you know? So all of those things are perfect subject for, for exploration. Um, speaking of spider, um, I guess, um Theater observed, and, and, and maybe Beckett was a, was an influence on that. Well, I think Beckett for me is always an influence, um, but that was of course uh, Patrick McGraw, the writer of the novel, uh, who you have to give you know the credit as the originator of that character. But in the feel of the character cinematically, which is different, I think enough from the novel. Yes, I was thinking of some. Beckett characters like Molloy and Murphy and, and you know, uh, Waiting for Godot, the characters in Waiting for Godot and so on. 
um, almost tramps, almost vagrants. What are they really, though? And and um, so there is some of that. At the same time, it's a a fairly clinically accurate examination of schizophrenia, which and and Patrick McGraw had worked in uh, some institutions in which uh, schizophrenics were confined, and and so he had some interest. He had some real experience of of a schizophrenic. Uh, people, and uh, so in a strange way, it's accurate that way as well. I would say that Beckett's work is is also, I mean, in a sense, I wouldn't say he was uh, schizophrenic, but he had great insight into that kind of thinking of, of a person separated from his own identity, uh, and 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 uncertain of what that identity was, and where you find it when you lose it, and what does it mean, you know. In an interview, you said, uh, I am spider. Yes. Um, what did you mean by that? Mm. Well, um, I'm aware of just how close I am to a character who could lose his sense of self, identity, and um, it, it's, it's, it's something people don't think about until they have to think about it. But for example, when, when a schizophrenic says, I hear voices, uh, people are telling me to do things, and you say, but there's nobody speaking. But you think of it, you know, you hear voices in your head all the time, you know, and especially now with the media that we have and people walking around with earphones. You're hearing voices that you remember, you're actually hearing voices of people who are not there because they're on your cell phone, and, and it'll only take a little bit of a disjoint to to have those people be real and and be right there for you, telling you things, controlling you. So I, I meant that I really felt that I I wasn't looking in this case as spider as a strange creature who I had no connection with, but actually as someone who I could definitely relate to. David, can we pause a second, please? I'll just open my mouth. But you go ahead and... Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah like weaving his, his net, his, his... Yes, yes, I mean, we are all the creators of our own identities in a certain way, even if we feel that that's something given. But in fact, we are actively involved in creating our own selves. And uh, I, I remember saying when I was, you know, doing interviews for Spider and so on, you wake up in the morning, it takes you a while to become who you are. It's not just that you have to have that coffee, you know. It's you have to remember who you are, where you are, where you've been, were your dreams real, who were you in your dreams. Uh, you have to reconstruct yourself every day. And if for some reason you could not do that, because of something that happened in your brain or your nervous system. I, I, can, I can understand that, I can feel that, I, I feel very close to that. So uh, that's why I could say I, I am spider and not be, you know, being very arch or, you know, pretentious. I, I really meant, I really meant that, that I, I felt very close to that character. As did everybody working on it, Patrick and Rafe Fines as well, I mean the actor, you know, we, it was a very difficult film to get made because it's not very commercial. And we all ended up not taking any money for it. And I include the actors, the producers, the writer, because we, we wanted Spider to exist, you know? And it became a question of, a, of existence of this character. We couldn't allow him to disappear. We were so close. So we all agreed to take no money in order to get the movie made. All of us felt the same way. So it wasn't just me who felt close to Spider. Uh, what I found very touching about the film is that he's trying to tell his, his story, to, to, to find his, 
his story. Yes. And he tells him tells it to himself only, yes. not to the audience. That's right. So the film is like detached, but therefore yes. very touching. Yes. Yes. No, I mean because I think most people in their daily lives, if you talked to them about being separated from themselves or separated from their own identities, they wouldn't know what you were talking about. But in certain moments of stress, of anguish, of pain, people realize that they can be separated from themselves. Sometimes they want to because the pain that they're feeling is too great and they must detach from that pain and that therefore they must detach from some part of themselves and that happens in moments of great stress great loss great disaster you find this i mean that people talk about post-traumatic stress syndrome and so on this is all very much what spider is experiencing um, how was it working with ray fines well, how, how oh lovely this yeah, well, I, 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 we were very close. I mean, we, I, I still feel very, very close to him. Um, very easy, lovely man to work with, very intelligent, very sensitive. Um, it's funny, he said to me, that's the least directing I've ever had. I've never been directed less. And I said, you know, when you're doing perfect work, I don't want to say anything. <laughs> I don't have to say anything. What, what, and I... It's partly because it's the script, but of course, when you're preparing for a, a movie with an actor, there's a lot of directing that goes on before you start shooting with the camera. You're saying what clothes, how, how is he shaving, can he shave, does he not shave, how, what is his hair like, what are his shoes like, how does he walk, how does he speak, and that's directing. And we worked on that a lot before we started to shoot. And by the time we started to shoot, he was he was Spider. I didn't have to, didn't, took almost nothing, you know. Um, but that was the ease we had with each other. Very, very easy and very, uh, so it was really very delightful to work with him. I have a long, strange history with the Cannes Film Festival because when I was, um, trying to figure out what I would do with my life, I spent a year living in France, and I lived in a small town called tourette sur Lou, the Lou River. Um, it was up in the Maritime Alps, a small medieval village, which I went to because um, a friend uh, lived, had, had discovered it, and uh, there was a Canadian sculptor named Jim Ritchie who lived nearby in the town of Vence. And uh, I just went to visit and ended up staying for a year. And that was very close to Cannes and to Nice. And at that time, I had made my underground films, and I wasn't sure really that I had a career as a filmmaker. I was still wasn't sure what I would do. I was still thinking I was going to be a novelist. And I decided, because the Cannes Film Festival was happening, I, I would go down to Cannes and see what that was like. And I did, and I was horrified <laughs> because you know I'd been living in this little town with maybe 900 people, no cars, and suddenly I'm in Cannes with the festival with Ferraris and motorcycles and helicopters and big boats and glitz and James Bond, you know, in front of the uh, uh, various hotels and so on. And I thought, uh, I, this is not for me. You know, if this is film. I can't do this. This is, and I ran back up to Tourette, you know. But then after a couple of days, I thought I should go back down again. It's just as maybe I didn't, you know, my attitude was wrong. And then when I went back down, I loved it. Of course, I had nothing to do with the festival, which was far away and inaccessible, really. But um, I found that there was a whole world of filmmaking that I had not known existed. On the street corners, people were selling films like drugs, you know, they would be selling a Turkish film to somebody in Finland, or, you know, a, a Spanish film to someone in Argentina. And I got involved with these, just met all these filmmakers who were making films that you would never really get to see in Canada, let's say. They were not, they were so far from Hollywood. Um, and it was a real community. Uh, of colleagues of sort of international filmmaking, and I thought, this I could I could connect with this. This was, 
It wasn't the Palais de Festival, but it was filmmaking. And uh, I found that very congenial. And I think that at the same time, too, I was able to stay in the Carlton Hotel in a very nice suite at night because the, the Canadian Film Development Corporation, which, as I say, then became Telefilm, had offices there. And as a Canadian who had made some underground films, they said, well, you can, I said, I have no money, I have no place to stay. They said, you can stay here at night and you have to leave in the morning because we have to open up the offices. So I was staying at the Carlton Hotel, you know, as a, with no money. That was very, it was very sweet. And so I had great affection for the festival, even though at that point I had no connection with the, the main part of it. But this was the marketplace. And um, later, uh, began to you know show my films as part of the competition and that was uh, um, a wonderful platform for bringing if, when you have a low budget film and you don't have a lot of money to promote the film you have people who come from all over the world who are interested in your film if it's in competition so even if you don't really love competition for, for art which I don't um, it's a strange thing to, to, to compete for films and say this is the best film, this is the best actor, because really the variety of filmmaking is so uh, huge that you, you can't compare the films. You know, you can have two films that are wonderful, completely different. Um, so, but the competition is exciting and it focuses on these 20 films, 22 films, and if your film can be one of those, and, and all film festivals work this way, but Cannes is the grand festival now, um, then it, it helps you sell your film and to get people to see your film. And so it's a, a, a something that it's wonderful when it happens, you know, that you can go to a festival like Cannes. Um, of course, I've been in Venice and Berlin as well, and they function in the same way, but each festival has a different character. You know. It was an American story, and uh, it, it came generated out of America, so uh, even though it was shot totally in Canada. Um, and in fact, I've never shot any film in America, ever, <laughs> even though many of my stories, like The Dead Zone, for example, Cosmopolis, they're set in America, but they were shot in Canada. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a, and, and of course, beyond America, there's a kind of archetypal feel to that story. Uh, it's almost Ulysses, you know, I mean, it's got its own odyssey. It's, 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 it could be a Greek tragedy in a way. Um, and in a way that's, you, you, and this is well known, of course, in art, to be universal, you must be specific. You, you have to set your story, if it's a story, of course it doesn't have to be, it could be an image, but it has to be in a, in a, it will always be in a particular context. You can't make something that's universal directly. You have to do it through specific things, but that has resonance for people uh, wherever they are in the world, and you hope that that, you know, you, you hope for that. Uh, you don't always achieve that, you know. Um, in the same way, for example, that an actor cannot play an abstract concept. You know, for when I was speaking, let's say, with Rob Pattinson about his character in Cosmopolis, I don't say, you are the embodiment of capitalism. And an actor says, what do, how do I play that? You know, how do I, what do I, how do I, what's my voice like? You know, you can't say that. But you hope that through the playing of that specific guy, the New Yorker, the wunderkind New Yorker, uh, hedge fund guy, that there will be a universal understanding of what capitalism might be, good and bad, and that he will, you will understand it better through him, the specifics of him. So I, I think that's true in general of art. So once again, in history of violence, very American story, very particular story set in a particular town and a state, but um, with, with kind of universal resonances, you hope, you hope for that. Uh, there are two sex scenes that are, I think, central to the, to the film. Yeah. They're very different. Yes. Why did you put them in? And 
what do you feel is the difference? Yes, yeah, they weren't actually in the original script, and they were things that I put in. Well, it's um, it's 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 sex between a man and a woman who know each other very well. They think, and uh, and yet they it's a sort of before and after. You know, it's a sort of during the illusion when they have created this these characters together and this marriage together. And then afterwards, it's a kind of, all of that has been stripped away and, and, and betrayal has been involved. And now it's just very raw between two people who almost don't know each other. It's worse than not knowing each other because they have antagonized, they have antagonized each other. Um, it sort of scenes from a marriage, really, you know, with Bergman film, that's a great, great film. A great TV, TV series, actually. Um, so my version of scenes from a marriage, you know, different different moments in a marriage, which in that movie those scenes take place very you know, within not too much time has passed between those two scenes. But if you are if you ha are in a ma marriage that goes on for many years. You have many scenes from a marriage, and you have sex scenes that are, or love scenes, or whatever, that are very different. You know, given the shifts and changes in people, it's very fascinating, very intriguing. There's no consistency, you know. And the second scene happening after, like, the Tom was forced to show this uh, real. Yes, yes, yes. You might say so, I don't know, yeah. real identity. Yes. Is it the second time is it more truthful or more passionate then or is it Well it's more desperate. It's more desperate the second time. Uh, because there's a desperation to keep what they had on on the part of both of them. Uh, and yet and yet it's much more raw because and in, in some ways it is more truthful because now they are the real people to each other. Um, and that's, that's not always a good thing and it's not, all, not always a bearable thing. I mean, there's a sense in which we, w with different people, we create a new character, you know? It's like acting. Uh, we do change depending on what our context is with each other and there's no guarantee that to be, to, because you are married to someone and you have sex with them a couple of times a week or whatever it is, that that is the most real you. It's, 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 it's a construction. And, and a marriage is a kind of performance that goes on for a long time. It's a performance art piece. Uh, but it, you might have a friend that you are more real with than your wife or your husband because of the chemistry. It's possible, I'm sure, you know. so. Uh, it was an opportunity within a sort of a gangster film to have a really interesting observation about the nature of marriage. And, uh when I first met Vico, I wasn't sure we were going to get along very well. <laughs> But then we started to talk politics and we saw that we were on the same kind of page with, with speaking about mostly American politics at the time. And, um, and it's just developed into a, a, a really enduring friendship, which doesn't always happen. You know, you, you, uh, it's notorious that uh, uh, a film set and people who work on a crew and the actors and the cast, it's very intense, very emotional, uh, but it does disappear and sometimes it comes back together again if you work with the same people and sometimes it doesn't. But you find certain people who there's a lingering kind of mm, relationship that doesn't die, that doesn't go away. And I found that with Vigo, really. Uh, we just connected in a way and, and the way that we worked together, it was a real very deep collaboration. Uh, we're full of humor and full of um, research, and we, we, we found that in many ways we were very similar. Um, and uh, and Vigo's a very unusual person, you know, he's an artist on many levels, a photography, writing, a poetry, publisher, 
Um, he's not, um, he's very multidimensional. And, uh, and that means there are many ways th 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 that someone like me can interact with him. And uh, so it's been a friendship. And it's been lovely because I guess really, I've never done three movies in a row with one actor, but I have with him. And, uh, and that's, been, that's been terrific. So we, we continue to be friends. And even if we never worked together again, although we're constantly looking for something to do together, um, he would still be a friend, you know, and uh, that, that does, that's rare. I, I deliberately wanted there to be no guns in Eastern Promises, um, because, partly because of the culture of the Russian gangsters, not that they don't use guns, of course they do, but I was really thinking of the atavistic, the primitive, the ancient sort of Russian, pre-Russian, pre-Soviet Union culture of Russia and trying to give some sense of that without being too obvious about it, uh, that it's very intimate and very emotional and very almost religious, ritualistic. And that means guns do not lend themselves to that. Guns lend themselves to disconnection. It's, it's very easy to be disconnected from someone when you shoot them. It's much harder to be disconnected if you're stabbing them with a knife or strangling them or punching them. You know, then it's very physical and you're very much involved in that other person's body and mind and so on. And um, that's the way I felt that these criminals were. And so I decided to just have guns not be a part of the story. You said almost religious. It almost yes. uh, feels like some kind of um, Christmas story in a way. Yes. Um, which is um, strange um, knowing that you are an atheist. Yeah. Well, I'm an atheist, but not all my characters are atheists. And uh, um, so it's true that I don't think about God ever as part of my life or anything. But if you are a dramatist and you are working with characters who come from a particular culture, you have to accept their understanding of life and with passion, you know. So um, the Nikolai character, I'm pretty sure he believes in God, you know. And uh, most of the other characters in the movie do too. Some of them are Muslims, some of them are uh, Eastern Orthodox. And that's a part of their life, a part of their understanding of suffering, um, because everybody in life suffers, but not everybody thinks of that in religious terms. These people do, and they think of suffering as a way to salvation, also in religious terms. And so, as, as, as a sort of their, their, I am their God, really, you know, <laughs> I'm creating them. But, so that's religious in itself. Um, so the, I am a very hardcore atheist, believe me. But um, I, you, you become like an actor, really, as a director or a writer. You must take on the character as that character is and believe in it as you're playing it, you know. Um, and allow that character to exist as he would exist. So that's really what, what that's all about. So I have no problem with characters who are religious and believe in God. I, I would have a problem if that was the point of the whole story because that bores me, you know, because I just don't have any intellectual or emotional respect for it, frankly. Um, but uh, as you know, in, in, in Eastern Promises, that is not the primary sort of dramatic engine. There was a very impressive scene in the bathroom. I uh, was wondering, what do you have to do to, to get such a, such a moment? Uh, mm -hmm. What is required uh, in terms of, I don't know, trust or...? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it is a scene like the, the knife fight in the... in the... Uh, in the uh, steam bath is is a matter of trust totally and it's a matter of artistic integrity and it's a matter of understanding it's a, a understanding what is required 
and accepting it and not being afraid of it. Of course, most of that had to do with Vigo. I mean, he had to, we, we sort of looked at it and we said, I said, because in the script it just said there's a fight. You know, they didn't, didn't talk about where the towels were or what you saw or what you didn't see. So it was for us, the stunt coordinator, me and Vigo, to work out. Um, and also uh, the production designer, Carol Spear, because I said, I want a theater, you know, I want a theater for this ballet. Um, so I need different interesting angles and parts of rooms and so on. She was creating that. Um, and then with Vigo, he s ultimately he said, well, it will be ridiculous to try to have a towel around me all the time, so I obviously must do it naked. And I said, yeah. And that was all we talked about, that was it. I don't say that that was easy for him, uh, but, uh, but he didn't make it difficult for me. But whatever he had to do in his mind to do that, because he hadn't done that before, not that. Uh, I don't think there are many actors who have done that before. Um, he, uh, he just, he, he, did, he did it himself in his own head. He, uh, once he said, this has to be this way, then there was no restrictions on me, what angle, what lens, what we see, what we don't see. Uh, as a, but the way I work, I always have monitors, lots of them, and I always allow my actors to see whatever they want to see. Not just in this case, not just with Vigo, but any. And some actors really are very interested to see that last take and to th see what they did to say maybe refine it. And some directors are afraid of that because they're worried that the actor won't like himself or it'll take too much time or whatever. I don't feel that way. I feel it's open to everybody. Of course, in this case, it was restricted because he was naked. But for Vigo, he could see whatever he wanted to see. And he wasn't obsessed with it particularly, you know. Um, but it's a comfort to know that I'm not trying to hide anything. It's all there, you know. And likewise, in the editing, I showed him everything. There was no, you know. So it, it is a matter of trust. Uh, it was our second movie together, and we 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 knew each other well, you know, our sensibility and so on. So it was. I don't think um, it takes a lot of those things coming together, though. But mostly the relationships of the people for something like that to be done. I've never really had any sort of, there has never been a gender divide for me dramatically. Um, my second commercial movie, Rabbit, has a woman as the main character, not the man. So, and, and uh, when I was writing Existence, for example, it wasn't working until the, I changed the main character to a woman, and then it suddenly worked. So um, I've, I've, I've always felt, and even in Dead Ringers, which is, you know, people accused me of being a misogynist, or, and, and I say, well, no, it's the characters are <laughs> misogynist, but not me, that doesn't make me a misogynist. But even then, the Genevieve Bougeot character is extremely strong. She is more than a survivor, you know, she's the strongest person. The men are not. So um, that has never been, to me, a, a, an issue at all, you know. Um, you know, we see wonderful movies like uh, Lawrence of Arabia with no women, like none. Works fine, you know, because that's, that was the, the theater that was played then. It was no women, it was war, and that was it. Um, so I, 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 you know, it, it, and I noticed that when I watched that movie, but it, it's, it's of itself, you know, it's not a political, it's not a statement of a social, so, social political statement or anything else, it's in the nature of what that story was. And that's the way I feel. Uh, it's just, it's just the way this, whatever, the, however the story unfolds. Um, so I've never felt that I must have a male protagonist to feel connected to a film. That has not, never been the case. And that includes those two movies, Shivers, uh, a Rabbit, and uh, existence that I wrote myself. Regarding Freud and A Dangerous Method, um, 
Some people said that they were surprised that I would make a movie like that. And um, I had to remind them that the very first film I made, called Transfer, which was only seven minutes long, was about a psychiatrist and a patient. It wasn't sci-fi, it wasn't horror, you know, it was a little surreal because they were having a psychiatric session um, in the middle of a f snowy f field, very Canadian. But um, so my interest in psychoanalysis and that relationship was, you know, it was deep because um, growing up in the century, um, Freud is a towering figure and the idea of psychoanalysis, the structure of the ego and the id and the superego was, whether people were aware of it or not, was really the approach that people had to understanding human psychology and the dynamics of the unconscious and so on was all very Freudian. Uh, the idea of children, the child being father to the man, you know, that kind of thing. The, the, the influence of what happens to you as a child uh, was not so common before Freud. In fact, people didn't think about children at all very much, you know, until they were adults. So his influence was huge, and I was aware of that, of course. Um, and he was an iconic figure even when I was a kid in the 40s. Um, and then if you're an artist and you're dealing with the psychology of your characters and human, the human condition, Freud is definitely someone you have to deal with. Either you, you either accept some of it or you reject it, but his ex explorations were definitely fascinating. And it always occurred to me that the relationship <clears throat> between a psychoanalyst and a patient was unique. It had never existed before Freud, and it was a unique, new kind of sort of basic primordial human relationship that you go to someone who you don't know very well, is not part of your family, is not your wife or your husband, and you're telling this person the most intimate, perhaps embarrassing things about yourself and your inner life and your dreams and so on. And this person is being relatively dispassionate and objective, is not reacting directly emotionally. It's a very strange relationship, and basically developed and, and created by Freud and his followers. So that in itself was intriguing. Um, and so I think then when I realized that Christopher Hampton had done a play, you know, I was interested because Rafe Fiennes was playing uh, Carl Jung in a, in a play called The Talking Cure, and I noticed that. Um, and that Christopher Hampton, who, who's, who I knew very well as a playwright, and of course then as a, as a writer of, of Dangerous Liaison, the movie, and, and then as a director himself, uh, so this intrigued me, and I, and I really, I, never, I have never seen the play performed. But I read about it, and I, then I read the play, and I thought, I really want to do this. This is, in a way, going back to some basic things, to, to really see the development of psychoanalysis, how it developed, why it developed, how it related to the concept, the Victorian understanding of what they called hysteria, uh, a disease that seems not to exist anymore. And that in itself was intriguing. How, how can there be diseases that disappear? Uh, why do they disappear suddenly? Are they really social phenomena, does that mean, rather than sort of innate human psychic phenomena? And, and all of this was very intriguing to me. So um, I got in touch with Christopher, and that's how, how it began, the, 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 the saga that ended up. It took a long time for various reasons to get the movie made. But uh, for me, it was a totally passionate, uh, project and and very intimate and very to me very um, I, it was a movie I really wanted to make and had to make and it always surprised me that people would say that's not a Cronenberg film you know excuse me <clears throat> I always wonder how people know <clears throat> what a Cronenberg film is, because I don't know what a Cronenberg film is, you know. <clears throat> Other than that it's a film that I want to make, to me that's the only uh, criterion that counts. And I really, that was a film I really wanted to make. And its style, which is very formal, 
um, pleased me. And it came from, you know, I, I don't think of my cinematic style as being innate. To me, it has to come from the material. You know, you, you, I don't impose a style on... I have, I have an aesthetic sense, and there are lenses I like to use and lenses I don't like to use and so on, but I want the movie to tell me what it wants. The movie tells me what it needs. And in this case, because this was a very formal society where there were great propriety and people were very proper and there were things that you said and things that you didn't say and things that you could do and could not do. And of course, that's part of what made Freudian analysis what it is because it was a very restrictive, repressed society. And he, in, a, in his own very formal, repressed way, broke that apart in the most revolutionary way. And so to me that it wouldn't, it would then have been improper to use sort of, you know, kind of shaky handheld camera and a documentary style and, or something very surreal. I thought that the material that they were all dealing with and the emotional intensity of it was, was what should be right up at front. So that determined the style of the, of the movie. And, uh, and, I, and it's interesting that, you know, when you find some people thinking they don't understand how that movie can come out of you, you say, yes, that's, it's, it's, um, it's more complex than you think. You can't really pinpoint uh, an artist and say, this is Cronenberg-esque and this is not, or, you know, however it is. And it's interesting, I mean, when you go to an art exhibit and you see, as we had in Toronto, uh, an exhibit of Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera, and people think they know what those artists are, and they certainly think they know, for example, what Rivera was, because he was a communist, and he is, is, is you know, it was almost Soviet socialist realism in a Mexican style. But you see his early work, and it's Cubist. It's, it's like Picasso, and it's beautiful, and really good. And you say, you see, you can't say this is not Rivera. He evolved, he developed, he had concepts, he changed what he was, uh, but they're both him, absolutely both come from him. And, and on the other hand, I think uh, there are many moments or uh, interest obsessions in A Dangerous Method that are to be found in other films of yours as well. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, Jung uh, um, having this idea to help people um, reinvent themselves. Yeah. I mean, this is a, something you, you dealt with in a history of violence or in, in other... Yes. Movies. Well, I think it, it, in terms of, at that point you're thinking of people's reactions. Uh, most people who go to a theater, they're not thinking about the director and his style and his past. They're interested in the subject and the actors and so on, and that's, that's correct. When there's a critic, then they have a, 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 a desire to connect the dots, you know, they want to see the arc of your career and so on. And they have their own idea of what you are and what you do, and maybe they've written about you many times. And so if you do something that's over here, it disturbs them, you know, and it has much more to do with them than with you, the artist, you know. It has to do with their mindset and their desire to to put things in their proper place so they get upset or that, you know. But I agree with you, though, that um, I think the connections amongst all my movies are, you know, probably pretty obvious. I don't think it's too too difficult to find those connections, um, and it depends on how astute you are, how accurate, how clever you are as a critic. Whether you see those things, and whether you want to emphasize those things, or you're more interested in what's different instead of what's the same. But at that point, it's not a creative question for me. It's really a critical question for them. Again, uh, there is, a, I think, a very interesting love or sex scene with uh, Samina Spielrein and Carl Jung uh, when he is when, when she is studying herself in the mirror. Yes, I found that very mm -hmm. interesting, very strange. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, of course, no one quite knows what kind of sex. Carl Jung and Sabina Spielrein had, and of course there's some people who still deny that they ever had sex at all, although from her writing it's very obvious that they did. Um, and those writings were discovered quite late, so maybe it's understandable that before that maybe it was not certain. 
but what kind of sex would it be? And, and it, it's a little bit sadomasochistic and in, the, in my understanding of it because she was a bit of a masochist and, and I think in her, in her treatment, I think Jung cleverly used that to help her understand her own sexuality, her own sensuality, her own worth. And so it, is, it, it came to me to be, to me, obvious that that would also have an, an influence on their own sexual uh, uh, adventures together. And that's why I played it that way. And of course, she was not just a patient. At that point, very soon, she became a budding psychoanalyst herself, who was, as Jung did and as Freud did, her own subject. She looked to herself first, because especially in those days, when it was hard to find people who would submit to psychoanalysis because it was considered very embarrassing and very strange to do this, you analyzed your own dreams, you analyzed your own sexuality, you analyzed your own sexual experiences as a young person or even as a child, you analyzed the potential sexual energy between you and your parents, uh, because that's, that was your basic subject matter. And so I felt that in that sex scene, Sabina would be watching herself. She's experiencing the sex and the sort of Sado SNM aspects of it. But she is observing herself as well. She, she wants to see herself as a subject, not just experience it directly. And also, uh, and then of course, the, the, that scene upset a lot of Jungians who want to see Carl Jung as this kind of angelic, heroic figure. But of course, he was as human as any, anybody else and it admits it in his own writings. Um, but I did actually play him as not being in, in, sadistic. He, he seems in, the, in those scenes to be rather uncomfortable. And I, we did that deliberately. In other words, he's doing it for her. He sees that this kind of cathartic thing that was always part of her being spanked by her father, but became a kind of neurotic uh, Im Im impediment to her life, if it was, he plays the role of her father and allows her to be fully sexual, and, and that releases her. But it's not something that he enjoys. So I wasn't really playing him as someone who was sadistic. And a lot of, I think, critics, and especially Jungians who were upset by that, did not see that. They didn't understand that. And there's a real sense of, I don't know, community. They are helping each other to yes. fulfill their... Yes. Desires. Yes, and and the fact that they were lovers, um, and 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 that their sexuality and their emotion completely permeated their concepts and their passionate uh, philosophy, and the creation of this new thing, this psychoanalysis, um, is perfect. I mean, it's it's what's exciting about the movie. They, there was no separation of. Emotion here, intellect here, they don't come together. No, they were together. Uh, and I think, in fact, in truth, it is that way in all people. But we have a feeling of being sort of intellectually distanced from ourselves emotionally, but it never happens. Um, people who are able to convince other people that some concept, some idea they have, whether it's Dar Darwin and evolution or, or Einstein and the theory of relativity, even in the most cold kind of mathematics, there is great emotion because it comes from humans. It's always connected with emotion. The two go together. And that is one of the things that intrigued me about these people, that the, that the two always, the art, opera, when, when she sees Wagner, she sees herself, she sees herself impregnated with a Siegfried baby, and that is Jung, who she's creating psychoanalysis with, who will do that. I mean, it all comes together. It's fantastic. Well, you see in the movie, he, he, he himself is trying to figure out what humans are and has become so abstracted and cerebral um, and so caught up in the capitalist zeitgeist that he has lost sight of what he is 
uh, once again, of course, an identity question. Uh, he could be Spider, really. You could see Spider in the back of the limo. And um, you do see, as the movie progresses, he begins to find himself. He becomes more human, more vulnerable. But there are moments, and it's, this is all, of course, from the book by Don DeLillo. This is what people say, he says, isn't it? This is how they react. This is how a man talks to his wife, isn't it? He's not sure. He's inventing it. He, he, he doesn't really know. Uh, he is so good at what he does, this sort of money trading that is so abstract. And really, it's even abstract from money. You never see him touch money. He doesn't actually know how to deal with money. He doesn't know how to take money out of his pocket and pay for something, which as you see in the end scene with Paul Giamatti talking about the credit card and so on. These are the physical things that you must do as a normal person. But Eric doesn't do that. He has people who do that for him. It's all abstract. It's all computerized. It's all what they call high intensity trading, which is trading stocks not because you love the product, not because you're trading Apple and you love your Apple computer. No, it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with computer money digitizing. Um, and, and so it's separated from what Marx used to talk about, which is the means of production and goods and actual physical things. It's completely abstracted. And so he himself is abstracted from being human. And in the, in the movie, he is in a sense, it is, the whole movie is leading to self-destruction. But it's to destroy something that he, he wants to escape from. He's trying to escape from what he is. And, uh, and of course, he does succeed. Uh, there's uh, the moment uh, he's talking about uh, rats to his uh, colleague. Mm. Uh, and uh, then um, the actual, the outside world, there is this happening and, and they are dealing with the rats. Yes. So I, I got the impression maybe this whole thing, uh, which he first mentioned, and then uh, the outside world reacting uh, outside the limo could be just like an apocalyptic dream of his. Yes. And uh, the end, being shot, would, as you said, yes. mean waking up. Yes, But, yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, there is, um, without pushing it too far, but he, he does, he has created a kind of surreal reality to him for, for his life that he conducts it primarily in his limo, that he makes everybody come into this strange world he's created. He doesn't go out into the world. Um, and so the, the separation of fantasy and reality and intellect and reality has kind of dissolved. And of course, the limo windows are screens. Literally for me, as a, as a director, because we're using green screen everywhere, And then at the same time, there are screens for Eric in, in the car. It's his, it's almost, they're almost touch screens, you know, the windows. Um, and what he sees, like the rat lady with the rat at the window, could be a computer game. And the, the, the window of the limo could be an iPad, you know. And so um, you get, you very much get that sense. And I think people who see the movie who live now in that kind of technology will understand that completely you know that, that everything is touching it's all but it's all screens it's what we were talking about before screens are still not our ideal you know it's still an artificial barrier between us and this sort of virtual immersive real 3d reality that we would perhaps like to be able to create and uh, so there is a, a very dreamlike element to the movie without, as I say, I didn't want to do sort of dream sequences or flashbacks or anything like that. But just the limo itself, for example, uh, there's a discussion in the movie about how quiet it is. And I had my, I, I make it completely silent when the doors are closed and the windows are up. Much more silent than it could ever actually be. And my sound guys, you know, when we were doing the sound mix, They were very worried about that. Don't you want some sound of the tires or some sound of the road? And I said, no, I mean, this is in a way, it's not realistic, but it's the way Eric wanted it to be. It's sort of his imagining 
that the limo can be completely soundproofed. He even admits later that that's impossible, that the sounds of the city will come in. Um, but he's made the attempt. And um, so that in itself, without being too obvious, and especially to a normal audience, which is not necessarily that uh, aware of what you're doing with sound, although they feel it, it would give this kind of surreal, dreamlike feeling to whatever happens to Eric and the limo. And then really that, that tone pervades the movie, though we're, it's fairly realistic in what we shoot. And it creates a constant tension. Yeah. It's also, it seems to be this space, like a mixture of a coffin and a, a uterus, if you will. Mm. So it's a very strange, disturbing mm. yeah. place. Well, the limbo became many things. I mean, yes, a uterus uh, and a coffin, a tomb, a vault, but also a spaceship, a spaceship, a video game. I mean, there are many things that, that, that the limo becomes during the course of the movie. Um, a sex toy, you know, all kinds of things. Um, there were people who said, yeah, it's uh, maybe a film about the crisis, but not really about the crisis, and we know all this stuff, and uh, um, but I felt that it's... It is a film about a crisis, but yeah. not necessarily about the financial crisis, but yeah. about the crisis of, uh, yeah, as, as you mentioned, connecting and meaning. Yeah. Yeah. And this is yeah. an overarching... Uh, yeah. I think it, it's interesting. I mean, in a way, the, the financial crisis maybe hurt people's understanding of the movie because it d diverted them into thinking only about that. But in fact, in the movie, there isn't really a financial crisis. Eric creates his own disaster economically. And yes, there are protesters protesting against capitalism in the streets, but there's really no suggestion that there's been a disaster on Wall Street. It's his own disaster, he's done it on purpose, and you realize gradually that he's been stubborn about his investments, and all his people are warning him that he's in trouble, and he still goes ahead. He deliberately destroys himself. So it's really Eric Packer's financial crisis, not anybody else's in the movie. And, and of course it's hard because of the Occupy Wall Street demonstrations and, and some other strange things. Um, for example, Eric gets a pie in the face by a sort of anti-financial activist. And, uh, and Paul Giamatti uh, texted me and he said, I can't believe this, but um, Rupert Murdoch just got a pie in the face. And it happened while we were shooting. So it, it was very tempting to connect what we were shooting with what was actually happening in the real world. But in fact, that's not what the movie's about. And, uh, and in a way, it can be a distraction. And perhaps the movie will be seen more correctly later, you know, when there is, we hope, maybe no financial crisis. <laughs> we'll see. But what indeed is very uh, scary, I think, is maybe not the coincidence with Occupy Wall Street, but Eric's comment uh, that yesterday it was a global uh, protest culture and today, today it's forgotten. He, he even uh, said two hours ago, a global protest, and now forgotten. Well, that's been happening. And, and there is a sense that there is a momentum in the world. And of course, the, the, you, see, you see there are documentaries and, and discussions right now about all the things that happen on Wall Street and with these investors, none of whom has ever gone to jail, ever been taken to court. Um, they're still out there functioning and Wall Street is working as it always did. So it takes a lot to really derange, derail capitalism in the modern world. It takes, would take a lot more than just an Occupy Wall Street. And after all, and it's been pointed out, and I think accurately, although you can you know, d discuss it, that the Occupy Wall Street movement wasn't really anti-capitalist. It was really, we want to share in the profits of capitalism. We want more people to have the benefit of capitalism. But it wasn't saying capitalism per se is bad in the way that Marx 
said that capitalism was bad. They weren't looking to replace capitalism with something else. You know, people like to say age is just a number and so on. And it is strange to, to, to think that I'm 70. I mean, I, I can't, I, I really honestly cannot connect me and my life with that number and what I would think of 70 as being and so on. Very strange, very strange. But of course, that life is full of that strangeness, you know, that you, 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 you become things that you weren't before and that you anticipate and that people have understandings of and that you did, and then you realize that it's quite different, really. You know, 70 is, it, it's meaningless in a way. So, uh, though I'm, I'm sort of, you know, honored to have somebody notice that my 70 birth, 70th birthday is coming up, uh, it, 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 and in some ways it means absolutely nothing, you know. So I, I, uh, I just continue. I don't really have a particular, you know, birthday wish, but thank you for asking. <laughs> You know, I sometimes say, I don't really care about cinema. I'm not really passionate about cinema. Um, I, and, and, uh, and then I think, and I think, well, in some ways that's actually true. Um, because there are people I know, friends like Marty Scorsese, who are very passionate about cinema, concerned with preserving cinema and, and, and uh, restoration of old films, which is fantastic that he does that, and the history of cinema and so on. And I think, I'm not like that. Uh, why is that? And I think it's because it's the act of the creative act of the imagination that is really what I'm passionate about. The, the, it's not the form, it's not the technology. And that's why I have no trouble saying video is fine and great. I have no nostalgia for film, like film stock, except for the smell. I like the smell of film. But I thought we could have an air freshener that smelled like Kodak film, you know? And that would be fine. I wouldn't need the actual film itself. So I don't have that other than historically, I don't have that incredible, intense, aching nostalgia for the technology of film, for example, uh, in a way that frees me. And as I say, if cinema disappeared, you know, I, I'm writing a novel anyway, <laughs> you know, and some, for some people the novel has already disappeared. You know, that's a theoretical thing. So it's really just human creativity that is a passion for me but not the actual particular form of it. I, I can, as long as, I mean, it would be very difficult if I could not ex express myself in a creative way. That would be difficult. But there's so many ways you can do that. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you.